Welcome to the People, Passion, and Purpose podcast, where you will hear from creative small business owners in the trenches every single day, talking story, talking lessons, talking failures, talking truth. I'm your host, Nina L. Kovner. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome today's guest, Aura May. Aura is the owner of Azara Salon and Wine, industry leader and educator, colorist, food personality, author, mom, wife, grandmother, board member of the American Board of Certified Colorists, and a self care enthusiast. Aura, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. What a biography. My I know, I was listening, goodness. wondering if I missed anything. <laughs> I'm sure I missed all sorts of stuff, but I just, you know, I, I'm so, well, welcome. I can't wait. I can't wait for everyone to get to know you better and and hear your story, but I'm a big fan of yours, Aura, and, and so thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's just dive right in because I have so much I want to ask you. How long have you been a small business owner and why did you open a salon? Well, I... Uh, just celebrated our salon's 25th anniversary uh, last year. And wow. we, uh, I went to beauty school with the intention of owning a salon. So my story is a little backwards from most people's. Um, I didn't have any desire to be a stylist. I didn't grow up doing my Barbie doll's hair. In fact, if I'd have cut my Barbie's hair, my mother would have killed me. <laughs> So it wasn't until I spent a couple of years in college uh, having some lousy college jobs like food service and front office medical that I realized that the customers who were coming into these places were miserable. And I wanted a career where people wouldn't be miserable coming and giving me their money. And I noticed that when I went to get my hair done at my uncle's salon, the customers were happily opening their wallets. And I decided that I should own a salon. I love that. And congratulations on on 25 years. That's amazing. So you have been at this a long time. Was there ever a time that you became burned out? And how did you recover? Well, I have, I've had a couple of moments of different kinds of burnout. Um, there was the, my business is literally failing and what am I going to do differently? Do I close it? Do I restructure? Do I go forward? Um, and then there was another time where it was more of a creative burnout where I realized that I wasn't doing awesome work on every client. And my awakening in that moment came when I lost a client that I thought I would have forever. Wow. How did you recover from these, these two episodes? Uh, well, the, the first, the business uh, required, you know, a, a serious come to Jesus talk with my accountant. It's a, uh, you know, one of the few places that I cry. Uh, <laughs> and he, he had a, a really stern chat with me and reminded me that my business license says it is a for profit business. <laughs> and perhaps I should give that a shot. <laughs> so, you know, we, we took some, some hard steps about how we were compensating people and how uh, the expenses were done and, you know, just regular boring math right. of making less go out so that there was something left at the end of the day. Um, and with the, the creative loss, it really was part of a bigger kind of existential turning point for me. Um, so I wasn't happy with my work because I wasn't happy with where my life was going because I wasn't, I, I didn't find the joy. I didn't have reasons to get up and be excited. I was just going through the motions and that kind of all came around. It was a, a middle-aged time for me. Uh, I was to just become a grandmother. I was not feeling particularly valuable in the world or that I had anything worth saying or sharing or doing. And so I worked through that from more of a 
spiritual self-help standpoint and the the creative stuff kind of fell in place behind it. Oh, you did the inside work. <laughs> I love the upside is I like myself a lot better now. So that's good. Ugh. Okay. That just made me want to jump to, to an, this other question that, that I was going to save for later, but I can't. One of the things I admire about you the most is this passion for self care. And it's good to be Aura May and, and, and your, just your energy and your optimism and, and your joy. You, you use that word that it's kind of a word that is really, um, central in my thoughts this year. Um, have you always been that way? What, ch- like, what changed? You, you know, you talked about midlife, but, what what changed? What sparked that? I'm going to make a change. I'm going to go inside. And, and what is that routine and how do you stay so committed to it? Well, I'm committed to it because I like this version of me better. So in my uh, teen years, I wrote all the angsty, drippy, icky poetry <laughs> that, you know, just poured out of me at every waking moment. I, you know, I was attached to people who weren't attached to me. Uh, I didn't have any sense of self at all, let alone self value or self love. Uh, So I just was wandering through the world, desperately trying to behave in a way that would make people love me, not at all aware of the fact that I needed to love myself. So it was really not until my mid thirties that I decided that loving myself was as important as loving others. I, oh, I love that. And you know, the, the other thing that I love watching, I love watching you on social, uh, is, is you, you're, you're outside a lot with Gracie May, uh, your, your doggy. Um, what, what, what does being outside do for you? you? I just, first of all, you live in a beautiful area, but I love watching you outside. You're outside all the time. Tell us about that. I am outside every day. Um, as much as humanly possible. My regular routine is we get up when the sun does and we go to the woods about 10 minutes from our house. And my eight-year-old Labrador and I tromp through the woods at whatever speed and pace seems appropriate at the moment. Uh, At that same time, I'm doing a practice called walking meditation. I don't know if Gracie May is meditating as well. (laughs) But she enjoys the jaunt, so it's working out really well for both of us. And really having this dog that must be exercised was the motivation that I needed to make daily movement part of my world. Because when she was young, if you did not exercise her, you would pay for it. Yeah, yeah, I bet. What's this walking meditation? What does that look like? So I take a a particular concept with me each each walk and I kind of use it as a mantra and repeat it inside my head. Um, When the hamster starts getting on the wheel and I start thinking about other things like what client do I have coming in this afternoon and what am I going to do about this and what bill is due? Then I come back to that mantra and remind myself to just be here now. So I think of it as kind of getting my head in the right place so that when I interact in the world, I've I've started from a foundation that is not distracted and is not um, scattered. I love that. And that really kind of makes me think of of an, another thing that I really wanted to talk about it, this uh, being a food personality. And I know that health and nutrition have become very important to you and are part of your self-care practice. And, and you are a food personality, which means you make awesome food. What inspired that? What, what Tell us a little bit about that. It's so cool. Well, my husband uh, developed diabetes, um, fairly early in our marriage. And as I looked around at the meals I was preparing as a family and what we were, how often we were driving through our dinners and the choices we were making were not in fact supporting his health, my health, the kids' health. So I decided it was time to teach myself how to cook foods from ingredients. 
So we, you know, my kids were mad because there wasn't soda pop in the house anymore. <laughs> and they, they'll still joke about it. If they come over to the house now and they open the fridge and find soda, they'll say, oh, was someone here? And I, I, I know this is almost a rhetorical question, but but eating, cooking with ingredients and eating, eating the rainbow, like like you talk about, that definitely has had a big part of your kind of self-care and this recovery of this this journey, I would say, of your self help. Well, here's the really interesting thing. We keep learning more and more about uh, the human condition and, and how things all are interrelated. And the hot new topic is the microbiome, your gut bacteria. And there is a very clear link between a healthy microbiome and mental health. So if you are eating a diet rich in whole foods and eschewing the things that are inflammatory and distressing to the gut, then those signals get sent to your brain. So a happy gut equals a happy head. I love that. And and you don't know this, but you inspired me to make two changes in, in 2018. And one was looking at what I was putting in my body. Um you know, nutrition wise. And the other was moving, you know, getting outside and, and, and walking. And, um, you know, I, I had a pretty gnarly 2017 when it came to mental health and you're absolutely right. You, you are, you just explained exactly what uh, the shift I knew I needed to make. And, um, it's incredible to think that we actually do have a little bit of control when it comes to, um, helping naturally medicate our crazy, ass brains. Okay. So I want to quickly shift back to a little businessy stuff. Um, you lead what's known as an independent stylist salon. And over the years I've heard, you can't have a culture and lead that type of business model. You've had a different experience. What, why, what's your, what's your response when people say that to you? Well, I think that the culture has to exist before, uh, you can nurture it, right? So for us, we started as, uh, like many salons do, as a, a flat commission salon and then came to realize that we weren't going to be able to sustain ourselves that way. So we tried a, a number of different business models. We did hourly pay, we did team-based pay. And when uh, we came to do a uh, relocation, to move the salon to where we are now downtown in this uh, super cool historic building. The staff that was coming sat me down and said, we would really like to be independent businesses. We feel like we've reached the point in our careers where that makes the most sense to us, but we still want to be a part of what we've all built here together. So when we moved downtown, we went to a booth rental model. So I already had staff who had grown my brand and were committed to my brand when we made this change. So I don't know that we would have been as successful starting from scratch with people who already had that mindset. Now, we still have uh, in our team of uh, hairdressers now, there are four people who worked for us back in the day in the in the 80s and 90s, who went on to go do their own thing, and then have come back. Uh, some of them have referred to it as coming home. I love that. Um, because it is often not as awesome in the outside world as you think. And it is nice to have a team to rely on and to be with people who truly do care. So the difference, I think, and I, I try to articulate this in when I'm recruiting new staff, which is uh, where we're at now because we've expanded and we now have room for new staff. We are different than other salons because we actually do care about the success of each individual. If you are running behind, someone is going to offer to help you. And in most booth rental situations, you're on your own. And not only does no one care whether you sink or swim, they may not even notice. So we're this weird kind of hybrid of 
it being in business for yourself, but not by yourself. How did you create that? What do you think? What do you think that was? I don't. I think we just all kind of grew up together because you know we were. Uh, one of the staff that is with us now, she and I went to beauty school together in 1987. Wow. We worked together most of our careers, right? It's longer than most marriages. Yeah. A lot of mutual respect there. I went to beauty school in 1987. I love that. I love that. Um, you know, and yes, all of that, I, you know, what you've been able to do and, and, and you do have that longevity, but you still lead and you still are the one that um, you're the leader, you know, and, and and I believe that, and I'll say this on your behalf, I believe because of who you are, I, I know you care. I know you care deeply. I mean, you're an educator, you are a nurturer, you're all of those things. And, and, and people are attracted to that regardless of how they're getting paid. So that obviously worked for a time, you know, in an employment based model and it has worked for you in an independent based model. And, and, and as I I have shared through most of my career, how you get paid is irrelevant. And, and you prove that in, in so many ways. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay. Let's talk about passion and purpose. What is that what does that mean to you? How does that drive you? How does that play into your daily life, passion and purpose? Well, uh, I have actually spent uh, no small amount of time pondering what is my purpose here. And uh, as someone who started as a musical theater major in college, uh, I was pretty sure that my purpose was to be a star. Mm. And it was not until middle age that I really came to terms with the fact that while I may be skilled and talented, so are a lot of other people. So what really at the end of the day, what I am is a teacher. And so I always hope in my, my daughter will tell you, that um, it annoys her occasionally because I look at everything as a teachable moment. <laughs> Same. You know, she'll start <laughs> telling a story and she'll just roll her eyes and say, I know, I know what you're going to say. You don't even have to say it. <laughs> so I figure my work here is done. If you know what I need to say without me even saying it, then I've said it enough. That's incredible. And you know, yes, I would agree. You are, you are a teacher and I also believe you are a star. Well, thank you. <laughs> Where can we find you, Aura May? Oh, I'm on all the places, all the all the socials. You can find my hair work by searching hashtag RMA, A-U-R-A-M-A-E. And if you want to see what I'm doing in the food world, I use the hashtag the RMA way. And you're welcome to join me on any of those on my personal Facebook page. I do accept friend requests from everyone in the beauty industry. So I'm happy to have new friends that way as well. I love that. Aura, thank you so much for being not only saying yes to to this podcast, but for being such a, a beacon of light in 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 the beauty industry and in the world. You truly are one of my greatest inspirations. And I venture to say uh, you are the inspiration of of many. So I love you. Oh, I love you too. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for being a guest. And I, I can't wait for people to hear this story. Thank you all for joining us today. And a big shout out again of thanks to Aura. Be sure to follow her and get inspired by her by her adventures with Gracie May and all her great food and her the incredible hair she does. Let's not let's not forget that. Aura, thank you so much. Mwah. Mwah. Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. To learn more about Passion Squared, you can visit us at passionsquared.net. You can find us on the gram and on Facebook at Passion Squared. And be sure to subscribe and share with your friends. We're so grateful. Thank you so much for joining us. Have an awesome day, guys. Love you.